I watched one of the recent talks of Dr. Paul Mason titled The Truth About High Cholesterol, and I was genuinely astonished just how horribly wrong his analysis was. And then it turned out that the madness goes much deeper than I initially thought. Whatever you expect it might be, it's worse, and I'm going to fully deliver on this promise. Dr. Mason starts his talk by referencing a systematic review and making some bold claims based on them on the review. Let's hear it out. The question is, what is the evidence that high LDL will kill you? This systematic review answered that question. 19 prospective cohort studies with over 68,000 participants were reviewed, and the overwhelming finding was that individuals with the highest LDL levels lived the longest. In fact, 16 of the 19 studies found this relationship. The higher the LDL level, the lower the chance of death. In the latter claim, Dr. Mason confused studies with cohorts. It's not 16 of the 19 studies, it's 16 of 30 cohorts analyzed in the studies. And if you account for statistical significance, it becomes 14, i.e. the minority. In fact, the majority of studies, 10 out of 19, didn't find any association or didn't provide any relevant information at all regarding LDLC and mortality or heart disease risk in any age, sex, or LDLC level group. Having corrected this minor mistake, we will look at the final claim in this segment before analyzing the whole segment. In a nutshell, the findings of this systematic review are robust, and dismissing or ignoring them is scientific fraud. Okay, let us commit some scientific fraud, shall we? Firstly, if some study claims to be a systematic review, it doesn't necessarily mean that the study is indeed a proper systematic review. Secondly, not all systematic reviews are created equal, as the result is risk of bias, miscalculations, or design issues. Fortunately, we don't need to analyze the review ourselves, as there is an official response to this review made by Dr. David Noonan et al. from the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine. Here are the conclusions at which CEBM arrives. I'm going to read the underlined part out loud. However, there are serious methodological flaws with their study, not least the lack of a published protocol, searching of only one database, non-uniform application of inclusion-exclusion criteria, a lack of critical appraisal of the methods used in the included studies, no indication of the quality or uncertainty of the included data, and issues with the accuracy of data extraction. A lack of controlling for confounding due to the effect of lipid lowering treatment and HDLC levels presents major bias and more likely underpins the majority of the observed inverse associations. So it doesn't appear to be as robust evidence as Dr. Mason suggests it is. In particular, I want to focus your attention on a few things from the response specifically. Firstly, as you can see on the screen, a few relevant studies were excluded without clear reasons as to why. And as you've probably already guessed, those studies all associate high LDLC levels with increased mortality. Secondly, the whole design of the review referenced by Dr. Mason is flawed to the point where no amount of quality data would help. Quoting the response, at the inception of a prospective cohort study, participants will be classified into two groups, high LDLC or low LDLC. Both groups will then be followed over time to record the rate of mortality to make comparison between the groups. The issue is that those who have high LDLC are much more likely to be prescribed statins during the period of observation than the low LDLC group. This would lead to an overall protective effect in the group with high LDLC, making it appear that LDLC is correlated with reduced all cause mortality when, in fact, it may be the effect of statin therapy. Thirdly, Two-thirds of participants of the review come from a single study, and it's the one that Dr. Mason mentioned specifically in this fragment. This study found about a 50% reduction in the chance of death in the highest LDL group compared to the lowest. CEBM questions the very fact of this study being included in the review, and it's hard to argue with the reasoning. This renders the review even weaker than it appears to be on the surface. Now, to be fair, for the purpose of our own analysis, we can just check the data ourselves. As is clear from the data, it's not quite the higher the LDL level, the lower the chance of death, since this claim isn't true for half the cases in the two highest LDLC groups. However, we can see that subjects with low LDLC are at a substantial disadvantage compared to those who don't have low LDLC. 
regardless of age, sex, and statin use. Hence, Dr. Mason's claims are in the right ballpark in the context of this study. So we'll give him that. These are just some of the issues of the review. There are also data extraction errors, undeclared conflicts of interest, unbacked claims, etc. So are the findings of this systematic review robust, quoting Dr. Mason? No, they are not. But if the review didn't have all these problems, would Dr. Mason's reasoning make sense then? The answer is still no. The review investigates the risk associated with LDLC specifically in 60 plus years old subjects. The elderly word is in the title. There is no way its results can be blindly extrapolated onto the general population. This is generally the case. One can't just say that if something is true for an average 60 years old person, it has to be true for an average 30 years old one too. That should go without saying. However, in our specific case, it's even more pronounced. For example, it makes sense for a study to filter out subjects who already have a heart disease before attempting to analyze how cholesterol levels affect the risk of getting such a disease. Which is exactly what the individual study that Dr. Mason briefly mentions does. And it also filters out subjects with diabetes. Therefore, even if the review was designed and executed well, it would still have little to no value in the context of Dr. Mason's talk. Believe me or not, but it gets worse. Remember that individual study which Dr. Mason explicitly endorsed? Well, here is one of its conclusions. I'll read this beauty out loud. However, cholesterol lowering treatment in the form of statins provides a survival benefit without correlation to cholesterol level. Our data show that statin prescription after the first lipoprotein measurement provides a significant survival benefit in almost all age groups in both sexes irrespective of baseline lipid level. Our data suggest that the beneficial effects of statin are partially independent of baseline lipid levels, as also reported in other studies. Given Dr. Mason's view on statins, I'm going to bet that he never actually read the study that he so strongly endorsed without a single disclaimer. But speaking of scientific fraud, let us look at the next part of the talk. I'd like to take a detour for a moment and address the long-standing myth that dietary cholesterol and dietary saturated fat increase LDL levels. I'll skip some of the elaborations and jump right to the reference. And in this quite fabulous study, they fed patients 35 eggs daily for a month. Their cholesterol levels remained normal. Okay, let's break it down. The reference study is from 1975, almost 50 years ago. That doesn't mean that the study is bad. However, a lot of things were different back then, including scientific standards. And probably eggs themselves. The study only had 8 participants, all in their 20s, which were followed for 30 days, so neither do the participants represent the general population, nor were they followed for long enough to draw any conclusions regarding long-term effects of a diet rich in cholesterol on blood lipids. Can we then find any studies looking at a substantial body of evidence? Yes, we can. Here is one systematic review plus meta-analysis and its results. In short, the more egg consumption group had higher LDLC than the control group. Know the remarkable lack of heterogeneity. Here is another systematic review and meta-analysis. So the scientific evidence is right there. Eggs do raise LDLC levels in the general population. Period. But is there any way to reconcile all this overwhelming evidence with the study that Dr. Mason references? Yes, but unfortunately that requires going to the extent of reading at least the title of the study. The study analyzes an aspect of treatment of severely burned people, 30 to 60% of the body suffers. Now if we do something completely unthinkable and read the study itself, we may find there a plausible explanation of why serum cholesterol wasn't jumping through the roof of patients fed with 35 eggs and then some meat and milk. Overall, do the results of a 50 years old study, conducted on 8 severely burned 20 plus years old patients eating 6 to 7 thousand calories per day, apply to the general population, or anybody at all 
who is not literally one of those patients. Not really. This concludes our analysis of the 35X study. So let's see how in the next part Dr. Mason fails to recognize evidence when it's right in front of him. Nor does saturated fat increase LDL. Consider this randomized controlled trial which gave subjects 50 grams of either coconut oil, olive oil or butter for four weeks. Compare what happened in these subjects who consumed the coconut oil, which contained 94% saturated fat, to those consuming butter, containing 66% saturated fat. This is what happened in the coconut oil group. Their LDL level dropped. This saturated fat causes LDL to rise theory isn't looking so good anymore. And despite containing far less saturated fat, the butter led to a significant increase in LDL. We could go through another study once again, point how it's conducted on 60-year-olds, and each group has only about 30 people, and how there exists at least one systematic review on the topic, pointing in the opposite direction, etc, etc. But instead, let's just agree with Dr. Mason that we know for certain that some products high in saturated fat are perfectly healthy by virtually any standards, including mainstream clinical guidelines. Dark chocolate is one such example. So it's not particularly clear who Dr. Mason is arguing with here, using a much more controversial example for some reason. But anyway, what do you mean butter led to a significant increase in LDL? What is it in butter that leads to increased LDL? Residual amounts of milk proteins? Traces of carbohydrates? It can't be all the saturated fat and dietary cholesterol, because that's what we are trying to disprove here, right? Just asking. I guess you are getting tired, particularly of my accent. So we'll only consider one more message, my absolutely favorite one, where Dr. Mason decides to debunk the very claims that we heard earlier from him. I've demonstrated that higher LDL levels are on average associated with longevity. That doesn't mean that every case of LDL elevation is a good thing, however. Take this graph of LDL versus mortality. You can clearly see on the left that the greatest risk of death is with the lowest level of LDL. You can also see that risk increases, although less so, with the highest levels of LDL. But each point on this graph is also an average risk ratio, just like those numbers from the initial systematic review. Except in the beginning of the talk, the risk was getting lower, or staying about the same, with increasing LDLC levels. And now we see a graph where the risk rises linearly after a certain point. You can't have the risk rising and dropping at the same time. These two things are mutually exclusive. Therefore, not only is Dr. Mason at odds with the scientific consensus, He's even at odds with himself. It's time to make conclusions. I think Dr. Mason's talk is a disaster, but I don't feel like it's intentionally misleading, because the presented information is way too ridiculous to be chosen intentionally. Chances are, the talk was given by Dr. Mason's confirmation bias, rather than Dr. Mason himself. Disclaimers are in the description of the video. Take care, and check your sources.